Good morning. Good morning. I thought we'd start with a little audience participation. Raise your hand if you've lived through a California earthquake. Okay, <laughs> this is a knowledgeable audience, Dr. Jones. Second question, have you lived through other natural disasters, fires, floods, hurricanes? Okay, this crowd has had what you describe in your book as disaster defined as divine punishment. So <laughs> all of us clearly are guilty of something <laughs> to have had this visited upon us. We're joined today by Dr. Lucy Jones. I'm sure you've read some of her information, but just to set the record straight, I like to credential my speakers, and does this woman have credentials? <laughs> She's a seismologist, was a, for, for 33 years the lead seismologist for the U.S. Geologic Survey. She's now a research uh, associate at Caltech. She holds a PhD from MIT and a BA in Chinese language and literature from Brown University. So that is what you call a diverse background. I think her study of Chinese and Mandarin has helped her decipher the earthquake <laughs> uh, science that we're gonna talk about today. You know, my first memory of an earthquake was 1957 at 11.22 a.m. at West Portal Elementary School in San Francisco when the earth shook and we were all dumping, uh, ducking and covering, and then we were taken out to the schoolyard until they could notify our parents. I remember going home because it was then safe to go home, and in our living room we had a mirror over the mantel place uh, uh, that was glued onto the wall, it had fallen into a million pieces, and all we could think of is had we been there, you know, the family where we sat every night after dinner and before dinner, um, we, we really could have had some injuries. So those earthquakes have great searing memories for me, as I'm sure they do for each of you. Are you scared of earthquakes, Dr. Jones? No. Because I've never been in a really big one. I, I know as a scientist that I was in Northridge, and, you know, but I was in Pasadena. And it wasn't like what it was in Chatsworth. I know that I haven't experienced the really strong shaking that's possible. And of course, since I spend my life studying this and get very few chances to experience it, when I do hit an earthquake, I'm, I immediately start counting because the duration of it will tell me how big it is. And so I'm sort of trying to observe because... You so know. it's kind of like the Lamaze method? Yes. You, agree? <laughs> you, you count. Uh, so when that trembler comes, you duck, you cover. And, and you, you count. And you count. <laughs> and is ducking and cover the right thing? Where should yes. we go? Yep, absolutely. There's lots of rumors around about various things that used to say stand in the doorway, right? When yeah, we were kids, that was what got taught at school. That was a Red Cross worker who in the 1952 earthquake saw a collapsed adobe house with a lentil, the, the door frame still standing and went, wow, that must be a good place to be and started, the Red Cross started teaching it. In fact, unless you're in a 200 year adobe, old adobe house, the door frame's no stronger than any other part of the house and it usually has a door that's lying around. Uh, Drop cover hold on, going under a table. We're all sort of can't do this here. But think about everything that's going to be flying off the shelves if it were to happen right now. That is much more common than any damage to the building. My husband thinks that I want to see him destroyed in an earthquake because of the book, uh, bookcase behind his desk and the knickknacks everywhere, and he has them toggled into the wall. Is that the right? Yeah, we hooked our bookcases into the wall mostly. You know, when we moved, the kids' got room got done first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we eventually got to our own. Uh, you know, so it's, the reality is, is you got to live with your life, and they're not that common, but all of those things make a difference. The fundamental is that the damage is a matter of choice, mostly. I mean, there's some level that you can't present, you know, prevent. You're, you know, you can't make these books really difficult to come out, right? Or nobody's mm -hmm. going to use them. So you, you make your choices, but you better hope that the bookcase is hooked to the wall. So you make choices, and you make choices about your buildings. And the California choice about building is actually make sure you can crawl out alive, not make sure you can reuse your building. 
So you can probably make your building safer than it is and, and more cost effective. Our estimate, it costs about 1% to build a stronger building to increase the strength by 50%. So uh, we could do a lot better than we're doing, but everything is a choice. How much do we want to spend now for later? I read something after, I think it was one of the earthquakes in Mexico or Italy about a triangle. Some oh, sort of Lord. Okay. Yeah, right. tell us about the triangle. Okay, the triangle, triangle of life is triangle a scam. Triangle of life. That's it is it a scam. It is, oh. it is <laughs> explicitly, and I don't know why the guy wants to do this, but it's, it, it, he wants to undermine the, I, I don't know why. It, it, how many have seen a triangle of life email convincing you to do it? Okay, good. Well, a couple of people have. It, it starts off by saying, I was in Mexico City when, in 1985, and uh, I saw this, you know, f uncovered a classroom of, of, of crushed children. Right. Every one of them right. crushed under their desks. And we shouldn't be going under the desk. They're going to collapse. We should go beside yeah. the desk where it can give you some protection. It's like, how do you know which way the stuff is falling? And it's also, it isn't true. No kids were killed in that earthquake. It happened at 7 o'clock in the morning before schools were open. And I have a picture from Mexico City of a concrete building, concrete slab collapsed, and is held up by weak little school desks. Because there was this whole room of them, and it held, them, it, held it up. I, and I don't know why it's there. It is, it is a study in effective viral communication because huge numbers of people have believed it. Yeah. PTAs have changed their mm -hmm. recommendations at schools, mm -hmm. which is just horrible because it's, it's a scam. So it's duck nothing. and cover. Duck, duck cover. And under du And count. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, the OES would want, the Office of Emergency Services would want to make sure I say drop cover, hold on. Okay. Uh, I say drop cover, count. Okay, drop cover, count. Tell us a little bit about you. I mean, while we're all terrified of earthquakes and fascinated by them, actually studying them and reading about them. What, what happened to you? <laughs> what, what, how did it, you know, a nice um, woman, nice little cheerful California girl. California yeah. girl. Yeah, what was it that drew you to this? My father is an aerospace engineer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, growing up in the 60s would be, yeah, women don't do science, but you're my daughter. Of yeah. course you can do it. And uh, he, nothing like a little good dose of arrogance, actually, to keep you going through this. And um, so I was fascinated by science. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I majored in, I started off uh, at Brown in physics, because um, physicists are arrogant and say they're the best scientists, mm -hmm. right? And I never looked at geology, because that's rocks for jocks. That's not, you know. Um, but I met some geophysicists and said, why do you want to be a physicist? That's making bombs. Come and be a geophysicist and you can play in the mountains and get paid for it. And mm -hmm. having spent my summers hiking through the Sierras, I grew up in West LA, um, I, it got me interested enough to take a geology class and literally got hooked. I, um, I read the 900 page textbook in the first week because it was just so <laughs> fascinating, I couldn't stop. <laughs> and why it's so fascinating, I'm not quite sure, but it's, it's that fun of science and exploration and finding new ideas applied to the real world and real world problems and making a difference. Mm -hmm. And in the 70s, when I got into it, I thought we'd be predicting earthquakes. My thesis research at MIT was funded on earthquake prediction research. And I, I started studying foreshocks. And that's actually because of the Chinese. So that mm -hmm. the other piece is my father's parents. My grandfather was a professor of theology at the University of Nanking. Oh. So they were missionaries. Uh, all my aunts and uncles spoke Chinese. Um, my dad had become an engineer to go work on the Yangtze Dam project, but got his degree three months after the Korean War broke out. Oh. So he became an aerospace engineer. But so the China was part of the family, got me interested enough to try studying it. I guess I'm a little obsessive because I got obsessed about that too <laughs> and ended up spending my junior year in Taiwan. But prediction. Go, talk, talk to us a little okay. bit about prediction, because that because that's what we want, we right? Do it? Right. That's what we all want. Yeah. The problem is, what you want is not having me predict every earthquake, because there's going to be 50 in California today. You want me to predict which of the tens of thousands recorded every year is the one that's large enough to do some damage. So what you want is a prediction of magnitude. And that's where the problem lies, because the magnitude, remember I said count to figure out how big it is? Earthquakes start at an epicenter, and, and they rupture from there down the fault. 
think about, I didn't bring any paper. Think about ripping a piece of paper. You don't do it all at once. You start at one point and rip down the paper because that takes less energy. Same thing on the earthquake. It starts at the epicenter and then rips down the fault. And if it just goes you know, across this room and then stops, we got a magnitude one. If it goes, uh, well, make me magnitude two. If it goes to the other end of the room, it's a magnitude three and a half. If it goes a mile, it's a magnitude five. If it goes 100 miles, you're over seven. And the eight is going to be about 300 miles. And it travels down the fault at a pretty well fixed speed, just about two miles a second. So a 200 mile long fault lasts for 100 seconds. When the, I don't know how many of you felt the Landers earthquake in 1992, uh, 7.3. I woke up with it, start, actually I was awake because I, I had a one year old, and uh, uh, started counting, and I counted 30 seconds. It actually, the duration was about 25 seconds recorded on the instruments. And um, so I knew before I got out of bed it was over seven. And since w it wasn't such strong shaking for me, I knew it had to be pretty far away. Right? Um, so what we're trying to do with prediction is not predicting how it starts, it's how it stops. And whether or not the information about where it's going to stop is in where it starts. And theoretically, it's starting to look like maybe the information is not there until the earthquake begins. That the magnitude is controlled dynamically by what happens as the earthquake gets going. And if that's true, prediction as people want it is theoretically impossible because the information about the magnitude just isn't in the earth before it begins. I, you notice I say, if that's true, that's a place where we're arguing, you know, the science process is a process of fighting with each other, right? We argue over it. You will find scientists that say, no, 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 the information's there, we just haven't figured out how to find it. And you'll find others that say, I don't think it's there at all. And there's different t people doing different types of research to try and figure it out. I think the papers that have shown that the, the twos and the sevens begin in just the same way very compelling, and I don't think the information's there. Well, what's this new app? Didn't we hear oh, yep. about our new app in Los Angeles? But that's not prediction. That's what's telling that? you that How the to earthquake... How to get to lift to get out of <laughs> It's telling app? you the earthquake has already begun, perhaps before the shaking gets to you. Okay, so let's think about the big San Andreas earthquake here. If it starts at the end of the San Andreas, we think that's relatively likely the end of the fault is sort of a stress concentrator. That's at Bombay Beach down in the Salton Sea. If it starts there, it will not, the rupture will be passing by this area about 20 seconds after the earthquake begins because you've got to travel that 40 miles. Right? And then the shaking has to get from the fault to you. So the damaging shaking won't be here till 20, 25 seconds after the earthquake's begun. So what we're doing with the app is using the seismic network we've always had and really speeding it up. So we're now saying, OK, we know we have an earthquake that's begun on the San Andreas Fault, and the waves from it will be getting here in 20 seconds. Um, and, one of the, and that's what the app tells you, is earthquake shaking expected. And it's a, it's a communications challenge, because when it first begins, in that first three seconds, it isn't an eight yet. It's still only a magnitude six, maybe, five and a half. And so we have to figure out how to, as the rupture continues to grow, sending update messages. Is it premature to bring this tool out? Will it be like I think crying wolf and then we won't pay attention? Uh, no, because I think it's going to be years before you get a message. Yeah. All right, what happened? Oh, okay. <laughs> Just uh, well, of course, it might be tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. That's the problem. We don't know. Yeah. And the big earthquakes happen infrequently enough that it's not going to be rung very often. I think we should be giving out messages for all the threes. I will say we had the Southern California Earthquake Center meets usually in Palm Springs, and we were having a meeting, and some people had the prototype of that app on mm -hmm. their phone. This was like two years ago. And there was a four and a half up by Desert Hot Springs. Mm -hmm. So we all felt it in the room. Mm -hmm. And like th five seconds before, or maybe th the, the shaking started, some people's phones started going off. Oh, interesting. Because the few people in the room who had it had as we were developing it. it. And, and it there was a little bit of that. Like, it was in the middle of a talk and what's going on. And somebody yelled out, this is the early warning. 
<laughs> and then the shaking came, right? And we were all really oh, excited. Yeah. And that gives you a, that it teaches you about using it. Yeah. The problem is, is we still have a lot of um, false alarms at the lower magnitude mm -hmm. levels. So they've decided the public one is only giving out at the higher levels. Uh -huh. And it means it just doesn't going to go off very often. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think what we really need is to get, get those false alarms cleared up so we can get the smaller ones. Uh, and we need a better education on how to use it. Yeah. Because if people use it to do inappropriate action, that isn't really going to be helping right. things. Yeah. By the way, um, she mentioned the San Andreas Fault. For those of you who live here or visit here, if you want to see an earthquake fault that is truly remarkable, it, it's you spectacular right here. So I, what, what little hike can they take? Where should they go? Um, Get a little tourist information at right. this little the talk. The best it's view be will be from the san top of the San Jacinto uh, Tram, the, the Mount San Jacinto Tram. And from there, you can look across the valley. So the east side of the Coachella Valley is defined by the San Andreas Fault. The valley's here because of the fault, right? The fault forms the east side of the valley. You can go and see it at Thousand Palms Oasis. That's some really good sites, and I think some of those are marked yeah, where you can see right them. Even right out here, I've done hikes. Uh, I don't know that I went down Bob Hope or at the, uh, at the other yeah. side, and they're just, it's a great Get hike. Get up on the, if any oasis on yeah. the east side of yeah. the valley, that's there because of the fault. Yeah. Because, the, because the fault moves so much, it grinds up the rocks, makes them very fine grain, makes them impermeable, and traps water. So in the desert, you preferentially have your oases down the faults. It's why in Iran, all of the old towns are on faults, because mm. that's where the water is in the yeah. desert. Yeah. How do you live your life differently with all this information you have about earthquakes? Um, or do you? I don't think we're that different from other people. I mean, there's some things we do do. And when do you own... Uh, did you buy California earthquake insurance? Yes, I have earthquake insurance. How many people in this room have earthquake insurance? That's a pretty good... That's, that, very, that's, that's very a good. lot more than the first... It's like 10%. Uh, it, we're up to 13%. 13%. Uh, get it. I mean, really, uh, the rates have gotten a lot better. Um, I, I, we got a $600,000 policy for $500 a year. Right? And um, it, now we retrofitted our house. But you want to retrofit your house anyway, right? That's the other thing. Yeah. Your house is as good as the building code that was in place at the time it was built and the degree to which it was enforced. And every time we've bought a house, my husband's also a seismologist, so speaking of how Double I, talk. Du double talk, house. yeah. Uh, the first thing we do is get a foundation specialist to come and look at the house and see what we could do to make it stronger. And uh, once we didn't have to do anything, once we spent $150, and we really only had to do that to get the earthquake insurance, um, another time we spent like $1,000 or $1,500. So it's probably not that expensive, and those easy fixes might very well have been the difference between um, no damage and $100,000 worth of damage. Um, and I think the degree to which you, you know, we as Americans don't like government telling us what to do. So our building code is solely make sure you don't kill somebody with your building. If you want better than that, it's up to you to do it. And you can. And, and sort of the, the top mitigation strategies for one's home? Uh, okay. If you're on slab, buy a house on slab on grade. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some of the best. If you've got a crawl space, sheathing the cripple wall, which means just, you know, the, the cripple wall is that small wall in the crawl space. There's usually two by fours. You push it sideways with an earthquake, it that goes over. That was Northridge, partly. Oh, yeah. a lot of the Northridge damage and, and all over in San Fernando. So after the 70, so the 76 building code said you've got to put reinforcement on that building. And it's just, it's just literally taking a piece of plywood and nailing it into the adjacent two by fours. And now when you push sideways, you've got this block of I would keeping it from going. Just make sure you use long enough nails. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very cheap fix. I know people who do it themselves. I don't want to join the Black Widows under my house. We've always hired somebody mm -hmm. to do it. So you wrote this wonderful little book called The Big One, How Natural Disasters Have Shaped Us and What Can We Do About Them. There are great stories in here um, about human drama of disasters that have struck. Which was your favorite disaster? 
and why? Oh. I mean, Pompeii. Yeah. Uh, po every Portugal, one of them was Lisbon. fun to research. Yeah. Uh, How did you do your research? Internet. Oh, my heavens. Everything's available to you. If I had written this you book. You mean you didn't get to go to Pompeii and Lisbon? I, and uh, no, no, though I've just <coughs> been invited to go to Lisbon to talk about it, so I'm really excited. Uh, I did go to Japan. And maybe I'll pick that one. I, there's all these historic ones that yeah. have all these cool stories. Um, but the, the most inspiring one, I think, is the women in Tohoku. So Tohoku is the, no, it literally means northeast. It's the north, northeastern part of the island of Honshu in Japan. And they had an earthquake in 2011 that caused the horrible tsunami and killed, the earthquake killed 150 people. Magnitude 9, 150 people dead. You can build to withstand an earthquake. But then it created a much larger tsunami than, than we thought possible. Before that earthquake, every seismologist in the world would have told you it was impossible until it happened. It, the amount of slip, which is how much the seafloor changes shape, was twice the size that we'd ever seen before. It was 72 meters. One, you know, I, we talk about the fault moving. Here we're talking about maybe 5 to 10 meters, 20, 30 feet, that one side moves with respect to the other. This was 72 meters, over two, 250 feet that one side moved up and over the other. On the seafloor, displacing all that water, created a huge tsunami and really devastated the coastal towns. And I got invited to go there by a group that had formed to help the women in the area. Because this is a very traditional part of Japan with very traditional roles for women. And, uh, and the emergency management, it very military based, like as it is often with us. And uh, there was extra trauma happening to the women in the emergency centers. And, and um, uh, this group formed to help them. And, you know, women, you do what you have to do to help your family. So these, what happened is there's such disruption to the society. The women ended up stepping into roles that really hadn't been available to them before because things were so disrupted. There were, it opens opportunities. And this group had formed to support women entrepreneurs that were, you know, creating whatever to keep everything going. And they brought me in to so be an example that you can be a, a woman and a mother and, and have a career. And it was interesting. We talked about that, but we also, you know, they, there were, I was surprised. I think of Japan as having so much earthquake education. Yeah. There was still a lot they didn't know. I ended up spending hours talking about aftershock patterns because mm -hmm. they were all living with this. Mm -hmm. And these, the women were really inspiring at how they came together for their community mm -hmm. and the commitment to rebuild it. And some of them had moved away from Tohoku. It was so traditional, it was so restrictive. They'd gone down to Tokyo. But then faced with the potential destruction of their hometown, and the, you know, they came back. What does Tokyo matter when our whole home is, is at risk? People keep coming back. They keep what is it? about that and, and when that's there's the disasters. Thing. What? I, I, that's where I worry about California. Do we have enough connection to each other to stay, to come back? How many people are just, you know, if you haven't had a shower in a month, are you staying? Or do you leave and go visit, you know, go just go to some family elsewhere? And, and in Tohoku, we were seeing not just the people staying, but people coming back from other areas to help rebuild and the strengthening of the communities um, in the face of a lot of problems. I mean, there was all the disruption, and then there's the whole nuclear disaster that happened with it, and the lack of information from the government. There, there was one woman I met there, Maki, who had been a stay-at-home housewife, was getting ready with, for her daughter's preschool graduation as the earthquake hit. And... Um, they were, she lived in Fukushima City. So when the, earth, the disaster happened out on, on the coast, um, they started evacuating out from the coast and the people left from there to Fukushima. And it was four days after the earthquake but she, before she even knew that there was any problem with the nuclear power plant. Mm. They hadn't been shared, and it was when people were showing up. And you know these people had been ripped out of their homes, that coastal area, coming in with just the clothes on their backs 
and getting measured for radiation exposure and, and having the clothes off their backs taken away from them because there was too much radiation exposure. Maki became, ended up becoming the leader of a uh, community organization to get information, to get Geiger counters into the town, mm. to train children. Imagine having to train your children to play on concrete instead of grass because there's too much, the cesium gets into the cracks around the grass and concrete's safer. Mm. Teaching children how to use Geiger counters so they can find the same safe place to play. Mm. And, uh, and she's just like dedicated her life to this. They, they provide all of these services to people. And when I asked her, and it's like, she's provided me the inspiration for what I want to do. Because she said, I asked her what she wanted to share with the world. And she said, I want to be able to look back in 20 years and know that we did too much to help the children. Because looking back and realizing we didn't do enough would just be too awful. Mm -hmm. mm. And that's, we've yeah. got to be able to look back after yeah. the earthquake and know we did too much. Yeah. Human emotion which you've just <laughs> touched upon. You, um, you talk a lot about that historically. Mm -hmm. And uh, share, share with the audience some of the, uh, the ancient reactions. When they didn't have Dr. Lucy Jones <laughs> uh, to help them understand the science, what? There's a fundamental human that's still here. And that and it, uh, writing the book helped me figure this out and, and put it together. I'd, I'd been aware of how much people don't want to believe in randomness. You know, like when yeah. we tell them we don't can't predict the earthquake, people would rather believe we're lying than believe that that's really true because the randomness is just so scary. I even had somebody write me after the Landers earthquake and say, I know you can't tell me when the next earthquake's going to be, but will you tell me when your children go to visit out-of-town relatives? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and so that sort of rejection of randomness, and I started to realize, if you, if you look at human evolution, uh, one of the fundamental things that how we evolved to be humans and with our brains was the ability to make patterns. You know, that we didn't have such big muscles or strong teeth, you know, we didn't have the, the same uh, assets as the other predators, and what we had was a brain. And we were able to, you know, see moving grass and hypothesize that that meant a hidden predator and able to keep safe. So we are very deeply wired when faced with danger to find patterns that will let us make ourselves safe. And that's, that's a really good thing. It's really important, you know. We, but when there is no pattern, we make it up anyway. Think about constellation of stars. We're really good at finding patterns in random distributions. And so when, when you got the question, Pompeii, you know, Vesuvius is erupting, why did that generation get destroyed and the previous generation have no problems at all? Well, the human, and, and then there really is no pattern, but you gotta find one, you put it on the gods because that's a pattern you can't test, right? Mm -hmm. And so your, like your Roman pagan approach was, you know, there's these powerful beings that are selfish and you just got in the way. Probably a pretty good description of their life under, you know, as a peasant under the empire. Um, but now, you know, Venus cheats on Vulcan and he has a male hissy fit and Vesuvius erupts. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and that, that was accepted across most of the ancient cultures as some pattern like that. The Judeo-Christian tradition went, no, God's good. God's somebody who you can make a covenant with. Make a Therefore, if you're hit with a disaster, it must be your fault. And we, you know, every culture has a flood story. It's the Jewish tradition that makes it the victim's fault, that it's because of their sins. And so it's a very strong thing throughout the Judeo-Christian tradition, so strongly so that we never researched why earthquakes happened. They, you know, they were unseen, they just happened, they must be God. Un until the Lisbon earthquake, which was this fascinating s study to see how that started the shift. At that time, everybody knew that earthquakes happened because because you were sinners. So the Lisbon got hit by an earthquake at 9:40 in the morning on All Saints Day. So a heavily Catholic country, everybody's in church. Or the churches were completely full. Every church in 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 Lisbon, and um, every church collapsed. 
So the pious who went were, to the 930 mass. Who went to the 930 mass? So he went to the mass early one, right? The, early. The, the king had gone to the early one to get out and go to uh, his summer estate, so he got spared. But uh, the church is all collapsed. Everybody in them dies, or mostly, because they, they then also set off fires. All the candles were lit for the services. And the fires swept through the city. And the whorehouses up on the hill were basically spared. They were wood frame buildings up on the hill and not in the river sediments. So it was a rather theological challenge for people. Um, and, and philosophically, there's a lot of debate that went on. So uh, Voltaire wrote a poem on the Lisbon disaster. And can you then impute to the babes who, who on their mother's bosoms bleed? You know, what sin can you impute to the babes who on their mother's bosoms bleed? And you know, he, he actually argued against this. And, Many people accused him of being an atheist because he rejected the idea of, of God's retribution. In fact, he was a theist, but that idea that disasters happen because God's mad at you was so ingrained in society, it must be proof that he didn't believe in God to be able to reject that as the reason for it. Um, so all this goes on, and actually one of the, the Protestants, of course, this was much easier. What more proof do you need that the Inquisition is the devil's work? And in fact, the Dutch government was asked for aid to the Lisbons, to, to Lisbon, and their response, they were all Calvinists, was God has decreed how much Lisbon should suffer and it is not our place to change what God has decreed. You just draw the analogy to politics today, right? When there's a disaster, what do politicians well, do? <laughs> well, we, and that's, we find blame. We have to find a pattern that keeps us safe. So we've got to blame somebody. And we used to blame God. Mm -hmm. We love to blame FEMA. Mm -hmm. uh, the <laughs> uh, and uh, we love to blame the victims. Because if it's their fault, then I won't make the same mistake. And it's a way of feeling safer. Mm -hmm. And I think if you just be aware of that, look at the next disaster coverage there will be stories about the stupid things people did mm -hmm. because we want to find a reason to blame them and say it won't happen to me. Should the me how should the media better cover disasters or do they do a good job now? Oh, um, please don't ask me when the next earthquake's going to be and does this mean that the big one's coming? Uh, That's what they all ask you. Every time. Does this yeah. mean the big one's coming? Uh, and actually, it's interesting. The local media have finally figured out no. New York always asks that because they want to know that LA is going to die. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is about it, but New York always asks that question. Um, mm -hmm. And I, th well, one aspect, uh, one media person told me, you know, a real part of what we are doing is trying to make our, our viewers feel better about themselves. Mm. So we criticize the victims so that you can feel smug when you watch it. Mm -hmm. And that that is a, it's, a, it's almost explicit in the media coverage. It's a manipulation. It's a manipulation because you're going to want to, you're mm -hmm. going to have a positive emotional mm -hmm. response to mm -hmm. a program that makes you feel better about yourself. Is there, uh, you know, you said we don't like government to control our lives, but <laughs> earthquakes are here, they're going to stay, there will be a big one. Will there, be, well, let me, will there be a big one? Yes. Let me, there will be. Absolutely. That, that is an affirmative. We do, we do not stop plate tectonics. This valley is here because of plate tectonics, and it's still going on. So there will... It will, will happen. Will, there, will a lot of little ones help dissipate the no. big one? No. No. In fact, that's, that's another one that p people like to believe. Um, the, the most constant feature of the distribution of earthquakes is the constant ratio of large to small earthquakes. For every seven, we have 10 sixes, 100 fives, 1,000 fours, 10,000 threes, 100,000 twos. Take any group of earthquakes, a set of aftershocks, all the earthquakes of California, all the earthquakes of the world, you'll see that pattern. It's sometimes called a B-value distribution or the gutenberg Byerly distribution. Gut and No, not gutenberg Byerly. gutenberg richter distribution, sorry. Uh, you know, we talk about the Richter scale. It was really the Gutenberg-Richter scale. S mm -hmm. Somehow poor Gutenberg lost out. Um, the, uh, uh, so that's an absolute constant. If you have lots of threes, that means you need to have more fours and fives and sixes to, to match up. Somewhere in the world or in a specific well, it, geography? If you've got, mostly 
connected. You know, it's mm -hmm. a volumetric. It take a, a big enough volume, and that re re relationship holds. Mm -hmm. You take a really small space. You know, if I take Pasadena, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to need a really long time to get enough earthquakes to to bear it out. Mm -hmm. uh, but you take California, or you take, you know, the San Andreas system, or even, or you know, really Riverside County, you're going to get a pretty constant relationship over a few decades. I had lunch with Lucy before uh, to get to know her before we had this talk and I don't know how many of you see the Saturday Night Live where they start doing an LA shtick you know from the 10 to the 405 to the 101 and then this. Well I started asking Lucy where faults are and she started doing the kind of the equivalent of the Saturday Night Live <laughs> yeah, the around Hollywood where fault, I live. The Santa Monica fault, <laughs> the San Andreas fault, the Santa Sino fault, the Palace Bird yeah, I live in fault. I live in, I live in Westwood. So oh, right. So at Westwood, you'd have the Santa Monica Fault, the Malibu Fault, the Newport Inglewood Fault, the Overland <laughs> Fault. <laughs> I'm surrounded. Yeah, uh, are. Just f a lot of stories about fracking. Are, are there exogenous um, activities that okay. will provoke faults there that we should worry about? There's one anthropogenic uh, uh, cause of earthquakes, and that is pump increasing the fluid pressure in the ground. So in, you know, a, we think of ground, you don't think of it as water, but in fact there is water in the pore spaces. You have a water table, right? And there's a pressure in that water, and as you go farther down in the, in the earth, the pressure grows. Let's imagine you built a big dam, and you now have a, a hundreds of meters of water now sitting on top of that. That will increase the pore pressure underneath it, and it will set off earthquakes. That we, have. we have whole sessions at our conferences. Big ones? The or biggest just little ones. It depends. It depends on what's available to be triggered. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest earthquake we've seen from a reservoir is a six and a half. Mm -hmm. So there was a Kaz an earthquake in Kazakhstan in the 70s. When the Aswan Dam was built in Egypt, it set off a magnitude five, did mm -hmm. damage. The Oroville Dam up in Northern California mm -hmm. set off a 5.7. When it was being built? Just after it was built. It's after it's impounded and you've got that it's water there. So 1957. Mm -hmm. um, 57 or 67? Mm -hmm. oh. The Oroville Dam would have been 67. Okay, so it was a 67. It was, as my father used to like to say, the worst disaster that happened since he was elected. Offner. Okay, okay. <laughs> so the 1960s, there was an Oroville uh, earthquake yeah. that, would, that was triggered by that. Um, and so, that, but that's not the only way you can increase pore pressure. If you pump fluids deep in the earth, you can set off earthquakes. Mm -hmm. We first discovered this when the army decided to dispose of some nerve gas. Oh. And they didn't, how do you dispose of nerve gas? It's this horribly toxic thing. Well, pump it so deep in the earth that it's well below the water table. So they pumped it down uh, almost four miles, on in uh, uh, four, four and a half kilometers, so three miles down in uh, Colorado. And suddenly there started being these earthquakes in Rangeley, Colorado. It was in 1966. And of course, the Army wasn't admitting that it was pumping nerve gas down in there. Mm -hmm. And so the seismologists were like, what's going on? Where did these earthquakes come from? And they was finally able to piece it together. And what happened? And when they stopped pumping, it went away. Um, Oklahoma had more earthquakes than California in, uh, in 2015 and 2016 because they were disposing of wastewater. So the fracking itself doesn't really set off earthquakes. But depending on how they do it, they often do it with a lot of chemicals in the water, right. which then contaminates right. the groundwater. So they have to dispose of that wastewater yeah. in a way that doesn't contaminate the groundwater. They pump it deep yeah. down. And in Oklahoma, they were putting it right into a formation that just dispersed, dispersed mm -hmm. the water and started setting mm -hmm. off earthquakes. And they, the largest one they had out of that was a 5.8. They also had a 5.7. So it's be aware and and prepare, or is it don't do it? Uh, it depends on how much earthquake risk you want to tolerate. Okay. And and the thing is, is they, you can't say it's only going to be a 5.8. Yeah. They have a fault long enough for a seven. Yeah. I hope nobody's pumping fluids deep into the eastern Coachella Valley, for mm -hmm. instance. Yeah. However, geothermal plants, they do the same thing. Yeah. So there are a lot of earthquakes at the southern end of the Salton Sea under the magma geothermal plant. The largest was a 5.3, did some damage. Um, and um, 
uh, also up in Northern California, the geysers. Right. Uh, there's a lot of earthquakes set yeah. off there right. from the geothermal plants. We have just under five minutes. Um, I have another question or two, but let's first pause and see if there are questions from the audience. Yes. So you download the app. Yeah. And um, it does that. Mm -hmm. And it says, um, it's like, <laughs> I guess, what it usually is going to do is take the time to get to it. Repeat the question. All right. So the question is, if we get the app and it says there's an earthquake coming, um, and what do I do with my few seconds to 20 seconds that I might have? Um, I would try to get to drop, cover, hold on. Because trying to do it during an earthquake can be a challenge. Uh, and we actually did a test. How long does it take to get under a desk? And I could not get under my desk, even when I was sitting at it, in less than 10 seconds. Just, I guess, those old knees and whatever. Getting down under my desk, by the time I would check, it was always 10 seconds. So an extra 10 seconds to get into a safe position, I think, would be what I would do. Good. That's assuming I don't have a small child that I'm dependent on me. I'd probably help them first, reality. Yes. And are you carry or keeping your home uh, emergency supplies in your car and your phone? And uh, OK, so the, whole, the question is about question. emergency supplies and what do I personally do. Uh, this, there's a little bit of this that's the, you know, the shoemaker's children. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and I know that I'm going to be at work and Caltech's going to supply me water. Uh, I don't focus too much on a kit because that implies you're going somewhere. That's great for a hurricane. To me, it doesn't make a lot of sense for earthquakes. So I don't store emergency supplies in a separate place. But I make sure that what we have. I do have a kit for my car. Because, like, I've got my car here with me now. I won't have my stuff at home. I've got a Mylar blanket. I've got some water. I've got a first aid kit. Um, and I have a crank radio. Um, and and, and w they've got these really cool things now that has a solar panel, a USB plug, and uh, a crank. And uh, you can charge up your phone, and you can um, uh, get the radio. Uh, so I do stuff like that. And I keep a few hundred dollars uh, at a secret place at home um, mm -hmm. because without electricity your ATM cards and your credit cards won't work. Question? Yeah, how about uh, talk on the heat in the air and what about time out and wait? Is there any the possibility that they would crash in and, and drain? drain? Okay, so the question, question. is about faults along the eastern Sierra and risks from high mountain lakes. Uh, there, there have been things that have happened, but it's usually that the earthquake will create a dam by a landslide and then blocks of water, and then if it's not stable and it fails. That happened in 1957 in Montana, the Hegman Lake earthquake. It formed a dam. The landslide blocked up the river, and then like two weeks later, it broke through, and there was a flood from that. Uh, I'm much more worried about man-made dams. When we did our <coughs> assessment of the big San Andreas earthquake, there are, our model says three dams will have such damage they will require immediate emergency evacuation. And that's on the basis that there are 30 dams receiving intensity, a certain level of intensity, where the estimate is 10% of them will fail at that level. Um, the Eastern Sierra has plenty of faults too. Uh, it isn't a worse risk than, than anywhere else. Yes. Okay, the question is how much, how can we tell what uh, happens? Smaller earthquakes on other faults taking stress off or putting stress on the bigger faults. What we know about earthquake triggering is that uh, it does happen. You know, one earthquake makes another earthquake more likely. Mostly they are smaller and we call them aftershocks. About 5% of the time an aftershock gets bigger than the main shock and then we change the name and call the first one a foreshock. But the rate at which one earthquake can trigger others is controlled by one set of equations that describe the aftershocks and can be extrapolated to larger magnitudes. And it is a very strong uh, spatial constraint on it so that it really is only at um, uh, very near the first earthquake. 
Well, this has been a wonderful hour for me, or 45 okay. minutes. Be sure to go get the big one, because it's a great read. And thank you, Lucy thank Jones. You. Thank you. The earthquake doctor.